Coming up on Something is About to Happen. We must begin to maximize the benefit of failure. Thank God for the failures in your life. Thank God for your failures because failure is what precipitates wisdom. If you haven't failed, I know you are not wise. Show me a person who has had consistent success and never failed or faltered or fumbled. I'll show you a person who isn't very wise. But those of us who are so stupid that we constantly fail so often, I want to make you a promise. If you don't just let the failure pass you by, but you study the failure and find out why did I fail, what precipitated my failure, it is in the questions that you ask of your failure that you begin to be imbued with wisdom and understanding how to succeed, how to victor and not be defeated. You really don't need much faith to make the unbelievable happen. You don't really need much faith to make what men call impossible become possible and actualized in your life. Just a little bit of faith is much more than enough. And so let's put the text in context this morning. And the beginning of this story is the ending of a lifelong situation of trauma for a little boy now grown and his entire family who hitherto had spent his entire life under demonic control he was operated and controlled by a demon and the young lad has a significant psychiatric complication uh, and beyond the physiological dimension of his mental health problems, this boy is controlled by a demonic personality, a demonic force, that it often pushes him into the fire into which he doesn't want to go and burn, and often makes him fall into the water and he doesn't know how to swim. Um, and his challenges are so impairing to the boy that he has to be under watch 24-7 because his parents don't want to see their little boy dead or, or lost or burnt uh, because of this control that the enemy had over his life and his pride has affected his entire family and his father as a result of the desperation from the pain and the complexity of the problem decides to bring the boy not to Jesus because Jesus is not available at the time but to the nine disciples who are in the valley underneath the mountain of transfiguration and ask them come and heal my son and he's thrown all inhibition away he's not self-conscious he just needs and desperately needs a breakthrough in the family and there were only nine disciples because three of them were on the mount of transfiguration with the master uh, enjoying an incredible phenomenon called uh, the glory of god where they saw christ in his original glory before he took on a human body and they they experienced him in an awesome way and it is as they descend from the mountaintop experience that jesus is assailed by a frustrated bunch of apostles who are exhausted from the vigorous attempts to deliver this boy his father and the entire family from their complicated plight it is difficult, my friends, to appreciate uh, the proper value of this text if you have never been through anything that has fully exhausted your spirit, your soul, and your body. If you haven't had a problem that similarly relates to this text, this text really won't, won't be able to help you much. If the nature of your problem has allowed you to remain polite all the time, then this text is not for you. This text is for people who are passing through stuff that makes you sometimes lose your nice even temperament and your good manners and the etiquette with which you were brought up to be a polite and civilized person. Uh, because my friend, uh, when you have this kind of trouble that the young lad and his family have, you become irritable, you become profoundly frustrated, you are on the, on the edge of your temperament, you are at the end of your tether, what we would call at wit's end, and if anybody touches you or says something wrong at the wrong moment or even greets you, you might fly off the handle. 
And Jesus has now come down from the power of the mountaintop experience to the demonic beast in the valley. And down from the big thing, he has come to the little thing in the valley. And he is waylaid by a frustrated bunch of disciples. And uh, the father of the young lad knows that this this is, is for people who have a connection with God. And, and he takes the boy to the disciples. But I want to say to you that some of us here, we have a problem that is not for bishops. We have a problem that is not for apostles. We have a problem that is not for pastors, teachers, leaders, miracle workers, or evangelists. But the Bible says that this man, when they failed, had to bring his problem to Jesus. Slap somebody a high five and tell them, I don't know about you, but the problem I have, this one is for Jesus. Because there are certain problems that bringing it to God's servants will not fix. Bringing it to your pastor, to your bishop, to your leader, taking it to the mountain or the camp or to Tulsa won't fix it. There are some of us, we have a problem and our problem is complicated because our problem has layers of problems. Jesus begins to peel back the several layers of complexity to the problem because often the problem has problems. The complication has complications. And we define the issue then as a complexity. And Jesus didn't just rebuke the devil all at once. He first sat in dialogue with the man. He enters into conversation with the father over the complaint concerning his son. And only thereafter, he rebukes the devil and heals his son and delivers them from this multidimensional problem. It is complicated. Now, all of you who have a simplistic problem that takes one laying on of hands or two prayers or two aspirin, this is not for you. But the rest of you, I want you to look at somebody for me and tell them, my own is complicated. Because you can have complex problems where uh, the problem has affected every member of the family. And if you deal with the problem and you don't get it right, it's going to affect something over here and something else over there. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's impaired the household. And if you deal with it, it's going to deal with other things. It's going to complicate things, perhaps even further. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Complex problems. It's on your job, and if you touch the issue, it's going to light up many other fires. It's like a can of worms. And if you pull at it, you have to be ready for the entire complication of complications. The problem has a problem. In fact, the problem is laced with problems. And today I want to talk to some people who are grappling with issues that are complicated. And there's no simple answer for your challenge. There's no quick fix for your issue because your problem has problems. Your circumstance has circumstances. Your complication has complications. Your predicament has predicaments. Your life is complicated. And Jesus peels back the layers like we do an onion and deals with the dad who's vacillating between faith and doubt and perplexity through the entire process of his having to deal with his son's issue. So I'm not talking to phony believers who act like their life has no contradictions. You know how you can bump into people who speak in tongues all the time and they always have Christianese, Bible quoting, toting things to say uh, and they act like as if their lives are perfectly one, one straight line of perfect pure holiness that they're even holier than God? Do you know anybody like that? Do a, do a road check and just give two persons an elbow and say, I hope he's not talking about you because he ain't talking about me. I have contradictions all over my life. Jesus eventually steps into the matter and he peeled it all back and healed the man's son. He healed what the nine apostles could not heal. He healed the family 
publicly in front of the crowd in front of the 12 apostles in front of each other he let the nine disciples know that what they could not do he was very able to do much more than they had experience and he was suggesting to them by the very feet that you will even do greater than I can do and the, the difference between my ability and yours is an impairment of your understanding of your faith and the disciples come to Jesus after the crowd has dissipated the crowd has has gone which must have taken some time and after they've after the crowd has dissipated they come to him and and they're seeking some sort of redress and they enter into a dialogue or into a multilogue with him and and they've, they've come apart to him to seek an understanding especially after their failure becomes very important to them so the crowd has gone they're alone with the master and they're seeking redress and they want to understand why did I fail what went wrong that, that I was unsuccessful what went wrong that we were unsuccessful in dealing with this problem so my friends to seek an understanding of why you fail is extremely important because failure is wasted value if you don't learn from your failures failure is a waste if you cannot figure out why you failed what's worse the failure or the confusion about why there was failure what's worse so they're on to Jesus now because they want to find out why did we fail they want to find out what's the why behind our failure and their question is far more than an admission of failure they're not just admitting that they failed they want to know why they failed their question suggests that victory ought to be normal their question suggests that the failure should prompt some questions in other words master this is supposed to work we weren't expecting to fail we weren't expecting to go through this terrible downward spiral when we are we are your apostles we are your, 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 your imminent regency when you check out of here. We are your agency. We are, we, we are those who represent you. We are you on earth. And it teaches us that we must begin to maximize the benefit of failure. Thank God for the failures in your life. Thank God for your failures because failure is what precipitates wisdom. If you haven't failed, I know you are not wise. Show me a person who has had consistent success and never failed or faltered or fumbled. I'll show you a person who isn't very wise. But those of us who are so stupid that we constantly fail so often, I want to make you a promise. If you don't just let the failure pass you by, but you study the failure and find out why did I fail, what precipitated my failure, it is in the questions that you ask of your failure that you begin to be imbued with wisdom and understanding how to succeed, how to victor and not be defeated. Moses failed his way to success. Joshua failed his way to success. Paul, the apostle of Tarsus, failed his way to success. Show me a magnificent success. I'll show you somebody who was first a magnificent failure. Failure isn't bad. But with who we are and what we have in Christ, we are not meant to fail. But when we do fail, which is part of the natural course of life, it becomes an opportunity for a learning curve where failure makes you teachable failure makes you hungry for knowledge because you hate the very taste of failure so how you maximize the benefit of failure is number one ask questions why did this happen to me I wish somebody would ask the question why did we fail why are we failing how did we get here if your business is broken 
How did my business get here? If your marriage is failing, how did it get here? Why? If there's a situation in your life that is complicated, you must ask the question, why? The largest, number one, trending, inspirational gospel music concert on the African continent. The Experience 2019. Let's Worship Jesus. Date is Friday, 6 December 2019 at the Tafawa Baliwa Square, Anikan, Lagos. From 7 p.m. till the break of dawn. Enjoy soul-stirring worship from your favorite gospel artists. Travis Green, Sinatch, Todd Delaney, Mercy Chinwo, Nathaniel Bassey, Planet Shakers, Ono Sario, Joma Jesus, Donnie McClurkin, Eden. Sammy Oposo, Tope Alabi, Brie Odede, Don Moen, William McDowell, and Metropolitan Gospel Choir host, Pastor Paul Adifarasi. It's going to be a night of worship at the Experience 2019. Friday, 6 December, 7 p.m. till dawn. TBS Onicon Lagos. Come, let's worship Jesus like you've never experienced it before. More details at theexperiencelagos.com. Brace yourself. The human mind was not designed to not know. It was not designed to accept not knowing why. In fact, to the human being, it is torment to not know why. That's why when we lose a loved one, we say why. Unless they're very aged. But if it happens at 24 or 36 or 27 or 52, we, we ask why. Or if she breaks your heart and, and jolts you and goes after another guy and you had planned to be married and you've been courting together for four, four years and she was your epitome of what a perfect marriage would look like and she was, she was going to really bolster your sense of value because you know she had value. And one day she wakes up and she says, Honey, I really want to talk to you. I'm not doing this anymore. We're not meant to be. Why? <laughs> and guess what she says? I don't know. I just know that it's not meant to be. But why? And he starts recounting all the episodes of romance and love and how suited in his eyes they were for each other. And, and she starts walking out. Why? Three weeks later, he's broken and still lamenting. And, and he writes her a letter. Why? She may not be able to answer his question, but he ought to find the answer, and he won't so quickly commit himself to something that is not committed to him. And my friends, it's in answering the why that you unlock the fountain of creativity, innovation, inspiration, and inventiveness. It's asking the question why. And when we can't answer why, then we cannot unravel the course of the complex problems that complicate our problem. And what happens then is that we, we come to conclusions about our circumstance in order to absolve ourselves of the guilt. And so, we have a propensity to evade asking ourselves the question, why did I fail? Why did my best efforts not work? This is important to deal with when you have very complicated problems that have defeated you. So the crowd is gone, and when the crowd is gone, that's when learning can now begin. Class begins when the crowd departs. And yes, learning does happen in crowds like this, and I don't want to make light of that. However, you are at best a good church member when the only learning you get is when you come to church. But you are a real believer when after the crowd has departed, you don't go to the bishop or the pastor, you go to God to ask him questions from his word, from the text, from a conversational experience in the koinonia fellowship between you and him. Because, my friends, learning starts when you are away from the crowd. So crowd seekers won't learn much. 
They may perform well, but they won't be well because all they have is a sensitivity to the crowd, not a sensitivity to God. Everything important that I ever learned, I learned mostly far away from the crowd. And so when you want to understand the power of this text, it is the fact that we are privileged to peek into a private discourse between the master and his protégés. We are allowed to listen in and find out the why of their failure. We find out that it's okay to fail sometimes. The failure is part of the design. We find out that it's possible to fail. We find out that even if you are anointed and heavily so by the master himself, that, that there is a solution to your present failure and that there is a purpose to your failure. And I'm glad that here in the text, I get to see public failure and that I'm not abnormal to have witnessed public failure in my own personal experience. And you know that some people act like they have never had failure. I'm sure you know some people like that. They walk a certain way. And when they see people like, like you, and they talk a certain way, and they have a certain uh, uh, em emission that says, you're, you're not good enough to be part of my world. Or you're not rich enough to be part of my world. Or you're not good enough to be part of my world. Do you know anybody like that? Just do a quick check. Do a quick check. Say, I hope he's not talking about you right now. The nine did not lack the passion to make that lad better. In fact, their coming to Jesus is not only an acknowledgement of their failure, but they've come to Jesus because they wanted to win. They wanted to succeed at making the boy better. They cared. They were compassionate. They had passion for his deliverance, but passion isn't always enough. People will, will observe your personal circumstances, your, your economic circumstance, your marital circumstance, your, your emotional situation, your every situation, and they'll say that if, if you were just a little more passionate about your life, you, you wouldn't be in the mess that you are in right now. But oh no, 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 no. These nine disciples, these nine apostles, they wanted to do right. They had passion for the young man's deliverance. They, they were on the right cause. They, they had the right outlook to, to get him sorted, but, but still they failed. What do you do when you did everything right, but things turn out wrong? What do you do? What do you do? They still failed. School is now in progress. You know how babies learn to walk? You were once a baby, you know. And I promise you that you learn to walk by falling and stumbling and failing and faltering. That's how you learn how to walk. Don't despise your failure. If God didn't want you to fail, he would have stopped you from failing. But failure precipitates a certain teachableness in your spirit where you now inquire for understanding as to how success works, how victory works. And so don't look at the bad failure that happened in your life one year ago or four years ago or two years ago or two weeks ago. Look at why God allowed it to happen because in its happening, there's opportunity for you to learn something. And so they ask the master a question. And it is the question that precipitates his discourse with them. And in the discourse, we have rich meat for victory in life, for solutions to our varied problems. Can I get a witness from somebody? So Jesus says to them, you failed because you lacked faith. You failed in the physical because of something you lacked in the spiritual. You didn't fail for the lack of passion. You didn't fail for the lack of effort. You didn't fail because you were lazy. You didn't fail for, for, for not doing right. You didn't fail because you didn't care. You failed because you didn't have the right perspective. Shout at somebody and tell him perspective is everything. In other words, friend, he was saying to them that you failed because your faith was faulty. We, we fail in areas that we can see because we lack something in areas we cannot see. We walk by sight instead of walking by insight. We try to live by sight instead of living by faith. And we fail not for the lack of sight. 
we fail for the lack of insight. Now, not everybody who claims to have faith really does have faith. Because if you, if you study them carefully, you'll notice that they're speaking something very differently from what they actually believe. Their body language is completely different from their statements, their pronouncements, their narrative. Have you noticed that even though your trials are tougher nowadays, they don't feel tougher anymore? Have you noticed that? So what used to make you mope and grope and, and, and weep and lament and cry your eyes out and walk the floor at 4, 4 a.m. in the morning every night, you snore now. You, you say, for, for this is a light affliction. But five years ago, you would never define it as a light affliction. But now you say it's a light affliction that is eternal in its weight, weightiness of glory. Because you can take a licking now and keep on ticking. You can go through that fire and still have a good attitude. Why? Because you've been through the same kind of trouble over and over and over again. Next week on Something is About to Happen. When you're standing up in front of a mountain, the mountain blocks your view of everything beyond the mountain. Because when mountains are in your way, they obscure your ability to see your possibility, to see your tomorrow, to see what's beyond the mountain. Can I tell somebody this Sunday morning uh, that there's a powerful life in front of you but there's a big mountain between you and that future is there anybody here who doesn't have a mountain if you don't have a mountain sit down but if you do have something that's standing in the way of your possibility standing in the way of your promise standing in the way of your prophecy I want you on the count of three to say mountain move one two three